Last week, we were in a series on outreach, and before that, we started with an introduction to Galatians, so we are picking back up on that theme in Galatians this morning. We are going to be in chapter 1, so if you have your Bibles handy, go ahead and flip open to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to be in uh, the entire chapter this morning uh, with a couple of focuses. One focus is going to be uh, the gospel and the differences between a distorted gospel and the real gospel. Not that I will solve all of that this morning, but that's going to be one theme, and you notice that with the worship music this morning. The second theme that we're going to discuss and and talk about as we walk through this is our response to that gospel in praising God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in their work in our lives. So that's kind of uh, where we're going to go this morning. It's Sometimes you can start a sermon or you can start a letter like Paul did uh, in many different ways. And I didn't, uh, I didn't go back and listen to the introduction to Galatians that uh, I think Greg preached. Uh, we were out in North Dakota visiting, and so we missed that Sunday, and I have yet to go back and listen to it. I did it partly on purpose because I didn't want that to... I don't want to say interfere, but I didn't want to, as I was reading through Galatians, go back and say, oh, he's already touched on that, he's already touched on that, and exclude myself from opening up perhaps some of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, but I will go back, hopefully, and, and listen to that. But as we walk through this this morning, if some of it was repeated from two weeks ago, then that's okay. You can hear it again, and if God is repeating something, then maybe we should hear it, and we'll see that in the passage today as well. Amen. Um, But there's lots of ways to start a letter or to start a sermon. Sometimes people start with jokes about the topic. For instance, uh, Paul in the introduction here is going to talk about his amazement or his shock. And so you might start with a joke about how I was shocked when I found out that my toaster doesn't mix well with bath water. So uh, you could start with that. You could start with the story of the the young school kid who his mother sent him with $2 for lunch the first day of school. And he came home that afternoon when he got home from school and he said, I'm so hungry. And she said, didn't you eat with the money that I gave you to send to school? And he said, yes, I did. And so she thought, okay, well, we'll give you a snack. And the next day she sent him home with, or to school with two more dollars. And uh, he came home again, and he got a call from the teacher, and the teacher said, did you know that your son is eating the money that you've been giving him for lunch? And he went to the, she went to the little boy and said, why are you eating the money? I'm just amazed at that. And he said, well, you said it was my lunch money, so I ate the lunch money. So, <laughs> so there's many ways to start it. And as we look at the introduction to Galatians, how Paul enters this letter, we can look at it and it can seem like he's rushing through the introduction so he can get to this one point that he wants to make right off the bat. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to take it a little different and out of order. We're going to start in verse 1, but we're going to discuss verse 6 first and go back and, and pick up the introduction in a few minutes. So in Galatians chapter 1, we find this, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor from human agency, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me, To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. I'm amazed that you so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not just another account, but there were some of you who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. And as we have said before, and even now I'll say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Now, Paul comes out of the gate swinging. I think we can all agree on that. He's, he's not uh, tiptoeing around it. He's not uh, coming in with platitudes, trying to soften them up. He gives a brief introduction, and it almost seems like that was, you know, uh, let's get this out of the way so I can get to my point in verse 6. What I'm shocked and amazed. What are you guys doing? 
are you eating, why are you eating the lunch money that I, I sent you to school with, right? He's, a, he's in shock. And he said, I could, I could see it if you guys were just hearing a different account of the gospel, right? If you're reading the book of Matthew, if you're reading Mark and you're reading John and you get those and you accept all those as the gospel, I would be fine with that. We talked last week when we were talking about outreach. There's different ways to present the gospel. You can walk through the book of Romans and present the gospel. You can, uh, you know, do it in a different way. We had little booklets when I went on, uh, took the youth slash college group uh, to Chicago back in 2010. Wow, it's been 11 years already. Um, uh, the organization we were with had a, a pamphlet that walked through the different steps, and it was, you know, a, a, I don't want to say a remake of, you know, some of the, the classic ones that have been done before, like the Four Spiritual Laws and, and the Romans Road, things like that, but it presented the gospel uh, just in a few steps that we could pass out to people. There's different ways to present the gospel that's still the gospel, right, that's not deviating from that. And Paul's saying, if, it was, if you were just hearing a different account, somebody's different point of, of view and context on it, I, that's fine, but this isn't what's happening. You guys are getting a distorted view of the gospel. Um, there's a few reasons that, that people can present a different gospel. Um, sometimes we, we've known people that have come through this church who now are, are preaching a different gospel, as it were, or, or sadly, some of them no gospel at all at this point. Um, life situations can happen that that test your faith and uh, steer you in a different direction. Uh, you have a, a particular teacher that you follow or admire, and they you can follow them onto a path that isn't particularly great. There, um, uh, there can be different motivations that motivate a people to present a different gospel, whether that is they want a big church so they can get lots of money, and I'm not saying that all big churches are just out for money, but one motivation for having a big church and distorting the gospel can be for financial, personal gain, which is not good. Uh, you can be looking for power, just having power. I like having power over a certain group of people, and if I tell them these things, here's what happens, and I get this kind of following. So there can be different motivations and different reasons why people can uh, distort or change the gospel. Uh, but Paul is encouraging the churches in Galatia to stay true to the gospel that we uh, preach to you. Now, let's go back and pick up the introduction because, like I said, it seems like he just rushed through that so he could get to his main point. But as we take a look at it, um, I, I think there was a little more thought put into it. So in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor from human agency, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. To him be the glory forever. Amen. If you notice, starting in verse 3, what Paul does is give a summary of the gospel. He starts out with what is the true gospel that we preach to you. So right before he says, why are you guys departing from this? He gives them a snippet. He gives them the condensed gospel and says, here it is. Here's briefly what we wanted to, what we told you and we preached to you, and you guys are departing from it. Now, I don't know if Paul and the Holy Spirit had a discussion on how to intro this letter. You know, if Paul was like, I'm just going to rip through and we're going to start with, they know I'm Paul, and we're just going to start in verse 6 and say, why are you guys screwing up here, right? Why are you guys, you know, eating the lunch money again? And the Holy Spirit was like, you know, come on, Paul, we got to write an introduction just like you do with most of your letters or, you know, I, I'm being a little bit facetious, obviously. But what Paul does is, and the Holy Spirit, as they work through this introduction, is he goes back and he lays out point by point uh, the pieces of the gospel. So we have the grace and peace from the ultimate source from God. We have Christ dying for our sins and rescuing us from our sin nature. We have God's powerful will and being in control of all things, and we have our response to that in glorifying and worshiping God. You have an entire picture there. And then in the first verse, he comes back around and says, okay, after that, now I've been given a mission. Now that I've been saved through Christ, I'm given a mission, and the fellow believers that are with me writing this to you, he brings in now the community, the church response to that, 
as he begins this letter. So he has, you know, this entire church and Christian culture now of being saved. Once you're saved, you have a new creation and a new mission. And once you're in that mission, you're in community with the church. And as the church, we're writing this to you out of concern. So you have all that packed in his introduction right before he goes into why are you so quickly deserting the gospel by him who called you by grace through Christ? So in 6, let's go back to verse 6 real quick. I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not just another account, but there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, he is to be accursed. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, anyone preaching to you a different gospel that's contrary to what we have received, you have received, he is to be accursed. Paul says, I don't, I don't care who comes to you with a different gospel. It could be me. It could be an angel. It could be your favorite preacher on television. I don't care who it is. If anybody comes to you with a different gospel, you've got to run away from it. That's no gospel at all. <clears throat> Paul, in the next section, starts his defense with anticipating some of the questions. Uh, he, after you've given somebody... Uh, a charge like that, you know, sometimes you can get defensive. Well, who are you to, to accuse us of this, right? And I think Paul might have been anticipating some of those questions, like we talked about uh, a few minutes ago. Well, Paul, are you just out for your own gain? Are you out to just build a bigger church? You know, what, what's going on here? And, and with Paul perhaps anticipates some of that, and he continues in verse 10 and says, For am I now seeking favor of people or of God? Or I'm, am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel which was preached by me is not of human invention. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul makes a claim here, I'm not just doing this to try to please people. Uh, we got to keep in mind, I think, in this context, most likely, the Judaizers are, are coming to Paul and saying, you're going to the Gentiles, this group of other people, and you want them to be brought into our group, but you don't want them to, to have the same traditions and the same background as us. You, you don't want to make them Jews. You know, that, we, we have to make them Christians, and part of that is making them Jews as well. And I think that was some of the big fight that was going on then. And um, I'm coaching Joel's soccer team this season, and as part of that training that I have to do for coaching, we have to take a, a safety course and a couple of other courses on, on how to deal with coaching and things like that. And they talk in that course about how to promote being a team, how to promote being a group, you know, what are some things and activities you can do to do that. And they say, I mean, here's the line. If you cross this line, you get into hazing. And I'm sure lots of people have heard, you know, the term hazing before, whether that's in the context of, you know, college fraternities or in, uh, even sports teams, you know, do it. Military does it in some ways, I've heard. Um, you know, where's that line? So that in that course, there was a, a conversation about how to be uh, team building and have things that are common to your team that bring you together as a team, but that doesn't cross into hazing and things that are negative and have detrimental consequences. And one of the things that they're telling Paul is, hey, look, they've got to be part of our team. They've got to do all these activities to be part of the team. And you're just telling them they don't have to because you're a people pleaser. You just don't want to uh, offend them. You just want more people in your congregation. So you're telling these Gentiles, you can do whatever you want as long as you trust God. You don't have to do this Jewish stuff because that'll make you uncomfortable. You're just trying to please people. And Paul says, if I wanted to please people, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Christ. Trust me, look at my, and, you know, you can look at his life afterwards and go, my life was not a picnic as I was a bondservant to Christ. If I just wanted to please people, this wasn't the way to do it. You know, I'm not doing it just to get a bigger congregation of Gentiles so I can get more money. I'm not doing it just to have more power over the Gentiles. I'm doing it because God has given me this charge to go to the Gentiles. 
In verse 13, he says, For you've heard of my former life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when he who had set me apart even from my mother's womb called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Paul continues by saying, hey, look, I had a, a good gig pleasing people before. If, I, if you were to compare me against anyone else being a Jew, I was one of the best there was. People, I was, I was you know, the A-team of being Jewish. I was pleasing people in a great way. If you're accusing me of being a people pleaser, why didn't I just stay there where I was really good at pleasing people? But I didn't. I had a life-changing conversion when God revealed His Son to me. Let's take a look at that life-changing conversion briefly in Acts chapter 22. In verse 6, in Acts 22, it says, But it happened that I was on my way, approaching Damascus, at about noon, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven or all around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, of whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up. Go on into Damascus, and there you will be told about everything that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I came to Damascus being led by the hand of those who were with me. And Paul's conversion came about with a direct encounter with Jesus Christ, not of any man-made invention or convention or circumstance. Paul says, I'm doing this because I had an encounter with the risen Lord, and this is who I'm a bondservant to now. I'm not just pleasing people. My commission now is from God. Continues on, verse 18 of Galatians chapter 1. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, and I stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see another one of the apostles except for James, the Lord's brother. Um, but now I'm writing to you, and I assure you before God that I'm not lying. I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia, if I pronounced that right. If not, I apologize. I was still unknown by sight of the churches of Judea, which are in Christ, but they only kept hearing, the man who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith, which he once tried to destroy, and they were all glorifying God because of me. And I don't think that ending line there, that Paul is saying they're glorifying God because of Paul, they're saying they are glorifying because of the Christ's transformation of my life, now going from persecuting the church, being a people pleaser, to now glorifying God. I went up, Paul said, to meet with Peter, Cephas. Uh, we had a chat, stayed with him 15 days just to make sure we're on the same page, that I'm not, you know, we're not colliding, uh, even though they had discussion and disagreements at points. But he said, I went up there, and I really didn't see any of the other guys up there except for Jesus' brother, but I went up there, and then I went on my way to where God has appointed me to go to the Gentiles. And in that, the Great Commission being fulfilled. This whole section, again, is to defend his ministry of the people saying, you're just doing this to please people. You're just doing this, you know, for various personal reasons. And he's saying, if I wanted to do this for personal reasons, I would have stayed back doing the thing I was really good at, pleasing people. So it can't, you can't accuse me of that. I'm doing this because of what happened in my introduction, because I saw the risen Lord. He died for my sins to save me out of my sin nature, and now we work as a community to glorify God. All right, so what do we do with this in the few minutes we've got left together? Uh, what I really want to focus on again is this idea of this distorted gospel and the real gospel. Uh, we're, again, we're not going to fix that whole thing today because... There's, there's a lot of ways we could go with it. But what I, I do want to emphasize, I think, is um, uh, one of the ways I think we can get comfortable with the real gospel. And what do I mean by that? 
In my job, I work in the financial sector. I work in security. And part of my job is protecting people's money. And in order to do that, we have lots of things that we look at. But one of the things we look at is what is normal and what is appropriate activity for a customer. So if Mrs. Jackson comes into the bank every day, or let's say every Friday at 4 p.m. and withdraws $40 for groceries, and she always wears her blue sweater with her, and she does that 2 o'clock to 2.30 every Friday, we get to know Mrs. Jackson and when she comes in and what she usually wears. And if we have a six foot five man who comes in on Monday and says, I'm Mrs. Jackson and I want to withdraw $80, we ask some questions. Number one, you don't look like Mrs. Jackson. You're a six foot five white man. Mrs. Jackson is a five foot two black woman. Uh, I don't think you're Mrs. Jackson. What we don't tell him, even though we know this and this is going through the back of our head, is Mrs. Jackson always comes in on Friday and you're coming in on Monday and she always comes in in the afternoon and you're here at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so the next day he comes in and says, well, I'm here on, on uh, behalf of Mrs. Jackson and she wanted me to withdraw the money for her new car and I want $2,000. <laughs> and we say, that's interesting. Is it a new car she wants to buy? And he says, yeah, brand new car. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, that's funny. I talked to Mrs. Jackson two weeks ago when she bought her used car and said she never buys new cars. And so in order to determine what is an aberration, what is different, what is distorted from the, the norm, what is good, I have to know the real thing. The best way to tell a distortion of something else is to know the authentic true thing and you know it very 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 well and that in my part of my job is to do that is to know customer patterns and traffic very 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 well so that when somebody bad tries to come in we say that looks really different I can't tell you all the different ways they can make it bad I can't teach you okay only uh, block this guy who comes in on Monday that would be We'd be doing that all day long of finding all the different ways you can distort it. But the best way to do it is just to know the real thing. And then once you know the real thing so well, anything else that doesn't look like that, you immediately start going, wait a minute, that doesn't quite look like the real thing. The same thing happens with the gospel. We need to know the real thing so well. We need to get so intimately acquainted with the true, real gospel that anything else that comes in, it doesn't matter how you try to distort it, anything else immediately goes, hmm, we should at least ask some questions. Now, it may be that Mrs. Jackson one day has somebody come in for her, and there may be a legitimate use for that at some point, that they're just seeing it in a different way, and it truly aligns to what Mrs. Jackson had, or as a parallel here, may truly align with the gospel. But we need to keep that in mind in Acts 17. The Berean church, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they had arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these people were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, and if, for they had received the word with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a significant number of prominent Greek women and men. The church there, they were eager to hear, they were open to it, but they said, let's check the scriptures, let's see if this lines up with what is actually true. And they said, you know what, this is, and many of them believed. And the same thing I think needs to happen when we hear, even in our culture today, we hear distortions of the gospel. That wasn't just back then in Paul's time in the Bible writing, we have distortions of the gospel today. In Luke 6, 39 and now he spoke a parable to them, saying, A person who is blind cannot guide another who is blind, can he? Will they not fo both fall into a pit? A student is not above the teacher, but anyone, when he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Another example that we need to actually be intimately familiar with the gospel. And early on in my ministry, and, you know, 15 years ago, whatever it was, 
you know, when we started doing some of this stuff, I'm sure I had errors back then that, I, you know, I should apologize for. Uh, I'm sure there are some things now that I don't have quite right, but hopefully I've got a solid understanding of the fundamentals of the gospel, which Paul presented back in verse 3, to say, okay, here is what at least the minimum gospel is and what it's about, and we can move forward from there. I don't want to be a blind person leading the blind, and in order to do that, I've got to be intimately familiar with the true authentic thing. All right, so again, we talked early on about some of the different reasons why people distort the gospel. Some of it's for personal gain financially. You see that for, you know, try to be nice here. You definitely see that in our culture today. You see a distortion of the gospel for financial gain. And that is, that's sad, number one. It's also um, detrimental to the people following that, as there is that idea of, you know, health, wealth, prosperity. Um, as you look and examine the scriptures, God never promises that. Uh, he may provide health, wealth, and prosperity for some in this lifetime who are genuine followers from him, but it is not guaranteed. If you look at the lives of the apostles, that definitely wasn't guaranteed for them. Uh, most of them did not end a, a healthy way in their life. Uh, one of the other major distinctions and some of the, you know, sects or cults today of the gospel is you add something to the work of Jesus. So it's Jesus plus something. In this chapter in Galatians 1, it's Jesus plus being a Jew. Today it's Jesus plus you've got to do X, Y, and Z. You've got to do, um, you know, a certain number of community service hours. You have to do, uh, you have to speak in tongues. You have to do whatever it is. Jesus plus something else is, I'll say, always a distortion of the gospel. If you're relying on yourself to help Jesus, you know, get your salvation, that's a distortion of the gospel because it's nothing that you can do. Self-help, that's another big one in today's culture, today's spirituality. Jesus died for your sins so you can be the best version of you that you can be. No, the best version of you that you can be is not enough to get you right with God. Now, through God's transformation, just like Paul said in this, God transformed me and I do good things now, but he did not die so that I could be the best version of me that I could be. The best version of me that I could be is still has a sin nature, still needs to be forgiven, still needs to be reconciled to God. There Again, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with seeking help or getting out of, of bad uh, patterns in your life, that kind of thing. That's good. But that is not the reason Jesus died for you, so that you could be the best version of you that you could be. Jesus died for us to take us from being dead to being alive. All right. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time. I pray that uh, as we walk in life, God, that we would want to passionately know, that we would passionately pursue the authentic gospel, that we would know it, better and better every day so that when things are brought and presented to us either personally or in the culture we can say that doesn't align with the true gospel um, help us not to be arrogant help us to be humble in that help me to be humble in that uh, but not lose sight of the true gospel because it is life-changing life-saving uh, for us and uh, so many people that need to hear it god Help us as we walk in this world to proclaim you in truth and in love. And uh, again, help us to, to worship and praise you for that. The, the follow-up and the response that Paul had was, and now I'm in community and we praise and we worship you uh, who deserve the glory for saving us, for sending your son to die for us. Help us to know, again, just you and the authentic gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.